The following program is produced by the Living Church of God. Are you deceived? Have you gone along with millions of others and been misled about the most basic issues of life? Is your mind truly open even to consider that your religious ideas may be wrong? Or was God wrong when he inspired the apostle John to write, The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. From the depths of my being, my friends, I ask you to open your mind and open your heart to reveal truth. Stay tuned. Tomorrow's World The Living Church of God presents Dr. Roderick C. Meredith Richard Ames Bringing you the good news of your future in tomorrow's world. This week, Dr. Roderick C. Meredith asked, Are you deceived? And now, Dr. Roderick C. Meredith. Why do you believe the things that you do? Have you truly proved your religious beliefs? Have you tested them by seeing if the Bible really teaches what you have been told that it says? My friends, please think about a statement from one of the greatest leaders in modern history, Winston Churchill. Sir Winston Churchill wrote, Men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. But why is it hard to admit when we are wrong? Why is it hard to face the truth? Yet that is the first thing a true Christian must learn to do. Notice what Jesus Christ said, Mark chapter 1 and verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. His good news or gospel was about the kingdom, which means government of God. And notice what he said. He was saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. My friends, repent means to acknowledge we've been wrong. It means to turn around and to go the other way. Are you willing to acknowledge that you're wrong? Most people aren't. But most of us have been wrong. And the Bible tells us over and over that the first thing we have to do is to repent. Understand that. That's what your Bible says over and over. Acts chapter 2 and beginning verse 38 in Peter's inspired sermon on the day of Pentecost. Then Peter said to them, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes, my friends, Peter said, repent. All through the Bible, men and women were told, repent. So could you have been wrong? Could you have been deceived about some of the most important issues of life? What life is all about? Why we're here? Where we're going? How to get there? If so, are you willing to repent? Now, notice what your Bible says about the fact you could have been wrong and why you could have been wrong. Sincerely so. Second Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes, But even if our gospel is veiled, or hidden of course, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age, not the God of heaven, but the God of this age, this particular age, the God of this age has blinded those who do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, uh, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Yes, men are blinded by the God of this age. That's what your Bible says. It says that. It says that the vast majority of people are blinded, the minds of, of, of people who don't understand. Notice Ephesians chapter 2, Paul wrote in verse 1, And you he made alive, you Ephesians, who were dead in trespasses and sins, you were cut off from God, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Notice, Satan is called the prince of the power of this earth's atmosphere, the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Satan is busy. He is working in the sons of disobedience. He broadcasts wrong attitudes. He broadcasts wrong ideas, wrong concepts. He deceives the world. 
And so we need to realize that and really understand that the Bible says that. It makes it very, very clear. Notice now in the book of Revelation what God inspired the apostle John to write. Revelation 12, verse 9, John writes, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Not a little part of the world, not just a few oddballs off in a corner somewhere. It doesn't say that. Satan deceives the whole world. He was cast back to the earth and his angels were cast back with him. That's what your Bible says. Notice chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, John writes in verse 1, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that serpent of old, the devil and Satan. So here's a great super archangel grabbing hold of Satan the devil. God is going to bind Satan for a thousand years during the reign, the rule of Jesus Christ, and bound him a thousand years. And he cast him into a bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him. Why? So that he should deceive the nations no more. So that Satan the devil would stop deceiving the nations. And that's what he's doing now. And he's deceiving most of you, my friends. You don't realize that. A deceived person doesn't realize he's deceived. But if you begin to compare what you believe to what the Bible actually says, and you're willing to get back to apostolic Christianity, to first century Christianity, the kind of Christianity Jesus taught and practiced, the kind of Christianity the apostles taught and practiced, then you realize there's a great divergence, a great difference between what you have been taught and what the Bible actually says. Think about it. Open your mind and think about it. At this point, I invite you to write or call for a free audio tape of this very program. This important tape will give you the opportunity to review this information and prove it from the pages of your Bible. So call today and request your free audio tape of this very important program. This informative audio tape is yours absolutely free. No cost, no obligation. If you call this toll-free number, 1-800-934-5579. That's 1-800-934-5579. Or send a request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 501-304, San Diego, California, 92150. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. No cost, no obligation to you. Call today. Now back to our topic. We were talking about the coming kingdom of God, the very purpose of human existence, and about the truth of our purpose in life. Notice Revelation chapter 20, verse 3, how Satan the devil was cast into a bottomless pit so that he should deceive the nations no more. Satan has been deceiving the nations, so they don't understand the whole purpose of human existence. They are blinded, because the God of this world has blinded those who believe not. Paul explained, as we saw in Second Corinthians. John goes on, Here is an I saw thrones, verse 4, And they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of them who were beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ. These faithful saints who had been martyred lived and reigned with Christ. They ruled with Christ for a thousand years. That's the reward of the saints. Think about it. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Here's what God says. Blessed and holy is he who has part in this first resurrection when Christ comes. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with Him, rule with Jesus Christ over this earth for a thousand years. And that rule, that reign of the saints under Jesus Christ is going to be on this earth. Because you read right on, just let your eyes follow down the column here, and you'll see Satan is loose from his prison, goes out to deceive the nations. It's on this earth the saints have been ruling. And when Satan is let loose, quickly they turn back away. They turn away from God because of Satan the devil. 
How awesome that is when you think about the power of Satan the devil and how he has deceived the nations. And yet, in our truth, in the Word of God, we find that, of course, the goal of the saints is to replace Satan. That's why he hates the truth. We are to rule over this earth, as Satan is doing now. Why haven't you been told this awesome truth before? Why have most of you been taught instead the idea of going to heaven when you die with nothing to do, just rolling around heaven all day? Because most of you have been deceived, my friends. I was deceived. I grew up at a mainstream church from the day I was born until age 19. My daddy and my mommy and my grandparents and others all just went and people were taught, go to the church of your choice. Follow your conscience. What do you mean, follow your conscience? If a little child in India follows his conscience, he might be worshiping some other religion that we don't understand at all and may be involved in some kind of worship of idols and that kind of thing. And the people in Africa might be involved in worshiping tree spirits or things of that sort, following their conscience. Your conscience is that part of your brain wherein the ideas you've been taught reside. You've got to educate your conscience, my friends, with this book. Most professing Christians in the United States are biblically illiterate. And nearly all of the polls show that. They have been biblically illiterate. They have never been taught. And they have never taken the opportunity to really study the Bible, to really understand this book. So you need to understand this book. You need to prove these things. I grew up understanding something else. I I understand where you're coming from. You haven't got it. You've never been taught about the fact the whole purpose of life is to prepare to be a full member of the very family of God, the kingdom of God, to rule over this earth for the next thousand years. You've just taught, well, go to church and be a good little boy and girl, and then you'll waft off to heaven with nothing to do. Kind of a vague, indefinite, nebulous idea of nothing. That's what most of you have grown up with. And so you don't understand Christ. You don't understand God. You don't understand the purpose of human existence. And most of your teachers have themselves been deceived. They've been blinded because Satan has blinded the whole world. And many of these teachers are not trying to teach wrong. They just have not understood. They themselves have been blinded. Notice what Jesus Christ said back in Matthew chapter 15. And he said in verse 12, His disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? They were the religious leaders of that day. They were the leaders, the teachers in the synagogues, the Pharisees. And Jesus offended those religious leaders. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. In other words, they were there for generations. But God had not planted them. There are many religious leaders in various places in various times who have been totally blinded. God has not planted them, and they will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, Jesus said, both will fall into a ditch. Again, most of you have been taught a false gospel about going to heaven with nothing to do. You've been taught to keep the pagan day of the sun rather than God's Sabbath that is clearly described in the Bible. The Sabbath of God is a sign of the true God, of the Creator God. The seventh day when God rested points to God as the Creator, the governor of the universe. Sunday doesn't do that. And most, again, if you you never understood that. And yet Peter, James, John, the Apostle Paul all regularly kept the Sabbath You look in your Bible and you'll find that. We have a whole booklet on that, which we've mentioned before and will again. If you want to write for it, it's called uh, The Christian Sabbath. Write for the truth about it if you need to. Why was their teaching and the practice that they had and Christ's practice changed? Why was the teaching and practice of Jesus Christ himself and the apostles of Jesus Christ changed? Why would that practice be changed? Notice this powerful quote. Uh, from Francis uh, James Gibbon. He was one of the main uh, Catholic cardinals around the turn of the century. And he wrote in his famous book, Faith of Our Fathers, quote, he said, You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. That's what he said. The Bible does not teach anything about Sunday, according to this Roman Catholic cardinal. Continuing the quote, The Scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we, that is the Catholic hierarchy, never sanctify. End of quotation. 
So he clearly admits they don't teach, you know, uh, Sunday because the Bible says so. They teach it because they have the authority they feel to change the day. And frankly, other churches are unwittingly following them when they teach, when they teach and practice a different day. Think about it. Many quotes come along showing you this if you're willing to look into it. Now notice these revealing statements in Hugh Smith's respected book, History of the Christian Church. Quote, the first Christian church established at Jerusalem by apostolic authority became its, in doctrine and practice a model. Remember, the Jerusalem Church of God, which I've described to you, this man says, was a model for the greater part of those founded in the first century. These Judaizing Christians were first known by the outside world as Nazarenes. All Christians agreed in celebrating the seventh day of the week, this historian says. Look on your calendar. You have first day of Sunday. And of course, in the, in the Latin world, it's called Domingo often, meaning the very first. Sunday is first. And then Saturday, Sabado, is the last. And that's the seventh day of the week. All Christians agreed in celebrating the seventh day of the week in conformity to the Jewish converts. Not just in conformity to the Jewish converts, though, my friends. That's the end of his quotation. But because God said so. Because they were following Christ. Because they were following the apostles. That's why they kept on observing that day. But as long as we worship Christ, people think, can't we just decide how we want to worship Him? Can't we worship Christ the way we want to do? No, we cannot. You're not supposed to learn the customs of the heathen, God tells us again and again in the Old Testament, and try to worship God with those customs. That's a deception that has been palmed off on millions of people. Again, they've been told, go to the church of your choice. Well, of course, in our free society, you can go wherever you want. I'm not saying against that. That's true. But you'd better find out which is the right church. It's better to find out which is the best job for you, the best career, not just go to any church or any choice of job or any anything. Think with your mind. God has given us a mind. So notice again what Jesus taught right here in Matthew 15. Matthew 15, now beginning in verse 1. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They weren't going along with the religious hierarchy of that day. Now, if you obey God, frankly, you won't be going along with the religious hierarchy of this day. And some of you will be persecuted and won't be as ha happy in this particular physical life in which you find yourself. Are you willing to put God ahead of man? Are you willing to serve God rather than man? That's where it, what it comes down to. Are you willing to have the blessing of the great God who gives you life and breath? So they were accusing Jesus' disciples of not following their human traditions. But he answered and said, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. That's what Jesus told them, reminded them of what God had written in the Old Testament. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever prophet uh, you might have received from me has been dedicated to the temple. So they had changed it around and where they were to give that money to, of course, the temple rather than to their parents to help them. And he is released from honoring his father and mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me. Think about that, my friends. Can you worship Christ in vain? He said so. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Yes, you can worship God. You can worship Christ in vain because you're not doing it the way he said. Yet without realizing it, many may be worshiping a false Christ, not even the true Christ. And think about that also. That's an important consideration. Notice what the Apostle Paul warned us about uh, back in 2 Corinthians. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says here in verse 4, For if he who comes preaches another Jesus... So here we hear from Paul about another Jesus, not the true Jesus, worshiping even the true Jesus in vain, which is possible, but in fact, worshiping another Jesus, whom we have not preached. Or if you receive a different spirit 
a whole different approach or attitude, you see, which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. He said, you Corinthians, you're a little naive, and you may just put up with that. Another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. Think about it. So what should we do? Should we just go along with whatever uh, idea comes down the pike, so to speak, and go along with the ideas of men and the traditions of men? We do need to understand, my friends, how serious this matter is. We must not go along with men against the way of God. When you think about apostolic Christianity, when you think about the way Jesus Christ taught, you need to focus on the fact that Jesus Christ knew what true Christianity was. He really did. He knew what true Christianity was. Who knew about Christianity if Christ didn't? And yet Christ said, turn back to Matthew 19 and verse 17, He told the young man asking the way to eternal life, He said, if you would enter into life, keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. Is that clear? Well, that's what Jesus said. You turn back to the writings of Jesus' favorite apostle, the one who leaned on his breast that last Passover evening, whom Jesus loved, as it says, John. And you turn to 1 John chapter 2, And I want you to turn there with me. Prove this to yourself. Turn to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. And it says this, Now by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. How do you know God? How do you know you're in the true religion? If you keep His commandments. Not talk about them, but keep them. Now, friend, I want to explain something to you. There is throughout the mainstream world of Christianity the idea of progressive revelation. That is, that the Old Testament prophets had a sort of vague idea of a a God and they they conjured up these various concepts and put it together. It was very crude, of course, because they were told to kill the murderers and execute the rapists and do bad things, supposedly, according to some uh, goody-goods today. So they came up with this crude concept of an old, harsh God. Then Christ came along and He was a very good young man and He brought more truth and He was the Messiah and died... But he didn't yet understand everything, apparently, because then the Apostle Paul, the great hero of the mainstream people, come along, and he then sort of did away with what Christ taught, and he said, you just believe on the name of Christ, you just believe on the the, the, the person of Christ, you get sentimental, little Lord Jesus away in a manger, and you get all sentimental about that, and believe on that, and just go along with that, and hocus pocus, instead of the railroad uh, track being switched down to hell automatically because of Adam's sin, now the switch is thrown. And then you shoot up to heaven because you said, I believe in Jesus. I give my heart to Jesus. And that's all you do. And yet your way of life remains essentially the same. Is that progressive revelation? That's not very progressive. But here, you think about it, you go ahead, and who wrote last of all? Who was closest to Christ of all? The Apostle John. And even the mainstream historians admit that John wrote after Paul and God inspired him to put this last in the Bible. And he said, verse 4, He who says, I know him, 1 John 2, 4, and does not keep his commandments, keep the commandments of God, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Think about that. I didn't say that. Your Bible says, a person who says, I know God, how how good it is to know the Lord this morning, so many people will say, and does not keep God's commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, lives by this word, studies this word, is willing to take the time and effort to really know what this book says, The love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. And he who says he abides in him, if you abide in Christ, if you abide in God, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. You need to walk as Jesus walked. You need to have Jesus living his life in you. As I've said so many times, my favorite scripture is Galatians 2 and verse 20. Look at it. Galatians 2 and verse 20, the Apostle Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. My friends, that's the whole key. Christ must live in you the same life he did live 1900 years ago, because again it says in Hebrews 13 and verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. 
That's what it says. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Christ lives in me, Paul said, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live with the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ must live in you that same life. That's what true Christianity is. Let the veil come off your heart. Let the veil come off your mind. And then do what the Apostle Jude tells us to do. Turn here to one of the very end books, the next to the last book of the Old Testament. And Jude writes to us, verse 3, Beloved, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly, to fight, or to fight the fight of faith to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all, once for all delivered to the saints. It's not to be monkeyed with. It's not to be changed around. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They call Him Lord, but they do not obey Him. Lord means master. So we must learn that we, to get back to the faith once delivered. We must learn to really follow the teachings and practices of Jesus Christ and the apostles. True apostolic Christianity. We must learn to really prepare ourselves for positions of rulership and the soon coming kingdom of God on this earth. And that's a major theme of this program and this entire work of God. Restoring apostolic Christianity. So, my friends, be sure to call or write immediately for a free audio tape of this program. Then you can review it. You can really check up on it and prove these things out of your Bible. So call today and request your free audio tape of this very important program. This informative audio tape is yours absolutely free. No cost, no obligation. If you call this toll-free number... 1-800-934-5579. That's 1-800-934-5579. Or send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 501304, San Diego, California, 92150. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. No cost, no obligation to you. Call today. Be sure to tune in next week to another powerful Tomorrow's World program. You will be taught and challenged with this exciting program on a topic seldom understood in our professing Christian world. And tune in every week as Richard Ames and I give you the meaning behind today's news and the meaning of life itself. See you right here next week. The informative audio cassette offered on this program is yours absolutely free if you call 1-800-934-5579 or send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 501304, San Diego, California, 92150. Be sure to visit our webpage at www.tomorrowsworld.org. The preceding program was produced by the Living Church of God.